sisters god bless hope all is going well with you it's going to talk more about keeping yourself in the love of god which is conceptually abiding in the things that christ accomplished through believing in what he has done it has to do with a particular mindset that is focused and clarified on what christ has accomplished so when it says keep yourselves in the love of god looking for the mercy of our lord jesus christ so when it says, keep yourself in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ, where do you look for the mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you look to the right? Do you look to the left? Is it behind you? Is it in front of you? How do you look to the mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ, but in your mind? It has to do with a certain comprehension and knowledge of the love of God, like where it says, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what's the height, the depth, the length, the width, to know the love of God which surpasses all knowledge, and that you may be filled with the fullness of God. So you can see this language, that you may comprehend with all the saints. This has to do with the mental mindset, where a mind is focused. That Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what's the height, the depth, the length, the width, to know the love of God which surpasses all knowledge. So we see this comprehension in this verse, to comprehend, to know the love of God which surpasses all knowledge. So it has to do with knowledge, what one knows, what one comprehends. It has to do with a mindset. That the mind set on the spirit is life and peace. It has to do with a mindset that is set on the spirit. That he that is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. And in our unification with him, we have righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. That by his own doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who became from us from God, righteousness, sanctification, redemption, and wisdom. So that just as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. So keeping yourself in the love of God is looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is through his life and his accomplishments by which he has given us redemption, righteousness, and sanctification. Keeping yourselves in the love of God is a mental mindset conceptualizing what Christ has done and who we are on the basis of his life and his work. You will know the truth and the truth will set you free. You will know the truth. You will know this has to do with the mental proposition. You will know the truth and the truth will set you free a lot of false teachers will come to you with this stupid mental assent stuff these accusations that you just have mental assent we're believing things in our heart that has to do with things we understand in the mind things that jesus accomplished that he made us holy without blemish free from accusation that he justified us he was handed over for our sins and he was raised for our justification so keeping yourself in the love of god is a mental mindset focused on the life and the accomplishments of Jesus Christ, who we are on the basis of that, and then taking oneself out of the equation, that we have died and our life is hidden with Christ in God, and when Christ, who is our life, appears, we shall appear with him in glory. That if you've been raised with Christ, keep your mind where Christ is seated on things above, not on things of this earth, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God, and when Christ, who is our life, appears, we shall appear with him in glory. So you can see that it says, if you've been raised with Christ, keep your mind where Christ is seated on things above. This has to do with the mental ascent, where your mind is fixed on things above, where you've been blessed with every spiritual blessings in the heavenly places in Christ. That he is our redemption, he is our sanctification, he is our righteousness. And these are the things that we believe about Christ, what he has accomplished in its totality on who we are on the basis of his life and his work. We are holy without blemish, free from accusation. We are the righteousness of God. We have redemption in the now. And these are the things that we believe about Christ. So when the scripture says this is his commandment to believe on the name of the Son of God and to love one another, that this is his commandment to believe on the name of the Son of God, what he has accomplished and who we are on the basis of his life and his work, that he was handed over for our sins and he was raised for our justification. 
So when Jesus says, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love, Jesus is saying, if you keep my commandments, you'll abide in my love. What is his commandment? To believe on the name of the Son of God. When you're believing on the Son of God, you're abiding in the love of God. When you're believing in the clarification of what Jesus Christ accomplished, that he made us holy without blemish and free from accusation, that God demonstrates his own love towards us, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And when he died, according to Colossians, he reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ's body by his death, that we might be holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. So this is the commandment to believe on the Son of God. This is his commandment to believe on the Son of God. So we're believing that he has made us holy without blemish, free from accusation, that he has justified us. So when Jesus says, if you keep my commandments, you'll abide in my love, what he's saying is, if you believe in me and what I have accomplished in its clarity, you will abide in my love. It's a conceptual abiding. It's comprehending with all the saints what's the height, the depth, the length, the width, to know the love of God which surpasses all knowledge, which is to say God loves us more than we could ever know, and he's demonstrated it through the cross. That he made us holy without blemish and free from accusation, so that God demonstrated his own love towards us, that while we are yet sinners, Christ died for us. So when Jesus says, if you keep my commandments, you'll abide in my love, that is defined as believing on the Son of God. If you believe on the Son of God and what he accomplished, you're abiding in the love of God. Keep yourself in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Keep yourself in the love of God is looking unto the mercy of God through Jesus Christ and what he accomplished, where God made him who knew no sin to become sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him, that righteousness completely independent from the law. So the one who doesn't work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accredited to righteousness. So the one who's believing in Christ, keeping that commandment, this is his commandment, to believe on the Son of God, that person is a righteous, justified, not guilty person. See, this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. It's not burdensome to believe in Christ and what he accomplished that we are holy without blemish and free from accusation. So when Jesus says, if you keep my commandments, you'll abide in my love, it is conceptually abiding in the faith, in your mind, in the accomplishments of Christ, in a clarified way, who we are, justified, not guilty people, the righteousness of God, holy without blemish and free from accusation. This is why we see in 1 John, it says, as for you, see that what you heard from the beginning abides in you. If that which you heard from the beginning abides in you, you shall abide in the Son and in the Father also. If what you heard in the beginning abides in you, what you heard about Christ, what he accomplished, that God made him who knew no sin to become sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him, that he was handed over for our sins and he was raised for our justification, that he reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ's body by his death, that we might be holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. It has to do with the gospel clarified and the work and the life of Christ. If that which you heard from the beginning abides in you, you shall abide in the Son and in the Father also. It's a conceptual abiding, a life and peace of the mind set on the Spirit. For the mind set on the Spirit is life and peace. For those who are of the flesh do set their mind on the things of the flesh, but those who are of the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded as life and peace. See, as us as believers, we're not those that have our mind on the flesh. We are focused on Christ. We are looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, looking unto the mercy of God. We are not those with our mind set on the flesh because we are the true circumcision who take no confidence in the flesh, but we boast in Christ Jesus and worship God in the spirit. So we take no confidence in the flesh. We are not those that set their mind on the things of the flesh, knowing that the flesh profits nothing. We look to Christ. And that is abiding in him. Like when you consider when Jesus says, Abide in me and I in you, for a branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abides in me bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. So Jesus says, abide in me, abide in me. Well, how do we abide in him? Jesus says, if you keep my commandments, you'll abide in my love. What is his commandment? To believe on the Son of God. 
this is his commandment to believe on the name of the son of God and to love one another. And I've already defined in the other previous videos what it means to love one another. It means to accept people based on their faith and the propitiation as children and sons and daughters of God. So if you want more clarification on that, you'll have to go to the previous videos. I can't just put all these thoughts in one video, so I have a collection of videos here. So this is his commandment to believe on the name of the Son of God, and that is how you abide in God's love. If you keep my commandments, you'll abide in my love. It's mentally keeping your mind set on the Spirit and the accomplishments of Jesus Christ where there is life and peace. And that's why Jesus says, the one who abides in him will bear much fruit. The one that abides in Christ, the mindset of the Spirit is life and peace, which is fruit of the Spirit. Abide in me and I in you, for a branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abides in me bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. Now Jesus says, if we abide in him, we will bear much fruit. How does the Bible define ab abiding in him? If you keep my commandments, you'll abide in my love. That is believing on the Son. This is his commandment, to believe on the Son. If you're believing on the Son, you're abiding in God's love. And when you're believing on the Son, you're believing on the clarified work of Christ, that he was handed over for our sins and he was raised for our justification, by which we have peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ, that therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace toward God through the Lord Jesus Christ, that therefore having been justified by faith, non-guilty verdict, we have peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ, which is fruit of the Spirit, which Jesus says about that peace, my peace I give to you, my peace I leave with you, not as the world gives do I give to you, let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. So peace, the fruit of the Spirit, is established through a justified, not guilty verdict by our faith, that through abiding in Christ by our faith, keeping his commandment, this is commandment to believe on the name of the Son of God, we are now justified, not guilty people in the past tense, therefore having been justified by faith, past tense language, having been justified by faith, we have peace toward God through the Lord Jesus Christ, not as the world gives does he give to us. So we have everlasting eternal fruit. This is why Jesus said, you did not choose me, but I chose you and I appointed you that you're should go bear fruit and your fruit should remain that we should have eternal everlasting fruit that it should remain that it's peace not as the world gives does he give to us so jesus just gives us the fruit of the spirit we don't have to work for it we don't have to plead for it we don't have to beg for it he just gives it to us but it's through the knowledge of a justified not guilty verdict therefore having been justified by faith we have peace toward god through the lord jesus christ so Jesus gives us fruit of the Spirit, which is peace, through the knowledge of a justified, not guilty verdict. It's not as the world gives does he give to us, so we don't have to let our hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. See, the mind set on the Spirit is life and peace. The mind set on the Spirit is life and fruit of the Spirit, which is peace. The mind set on yourself is not going to produce peace. It's going to produce the opposite of that. That's why we have died and our life is hidden with Christ and God, and we keep our mind where Christ is seated on things above. We're looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. He has accomplished everything that we need that makes us victorious. He being the object of our faith, whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. So we're more than conquerors through him that loved us. We're more then victorious by our faith, Jesus Christ being the object of our faith, who was handed over for our sins and he was raised for our justification. So abiding in him is a mental ongoing mindset on the clarification of the life and work of Christ and who you are on the basis of that. Christ will never leave or forsake us. We are sealed with the Spirit until the day of redemption. He is always abiding in us. We abide in him by keeping the mind set on the spirit. It's an ongoing conceptualization of the truth of the life and work of Christ that produces joy and peace. So when Jesus says, abide in me and I in you, for a branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. We're talking about producing the fruit of joy and peace in relation to the work of Christ and what he accomplished, keeping our mind on things of the spirit and not of the flesh.
If we consider in Isaiah where it says, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he has clothed me in the garments of salvation. He has covered me in the robe of righteousness. Now, can you see the garments of salvation? Can you see the robe of righteousness that is on you? Well, no, you can't. That's why we walk by faith and not by sight and the promises of a God who cannot lie. So this has to do with the mental mindset. God has spoken. He has declared it. We believe it. We believe that he has covered us with a robe of righteousness and clothed us with the garments of salvation, which produces joy. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord, and my soul shall be joyful in my God. This has to do with fruits of the Spirit. Notice they are produced by the knowledge that we're covered with the garments of salvation and covered with a robe of righteousness. Now we as believers collectively and equally share this robe of righteousness, Romans 3.22, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith in Christ Jesus upon all and unto all who believe, and there is no difference, that we're collectively and equally clothed with the robe of righteousness and the garments of salvation. And the knowledge of these things, the mental mindset of these things produces joy. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord and my soul shall be joyful in my God for he has clothed me in the garments of salvation. He has covered me in the robe of righteousness. See, if you don't understand that you have been clothed in a robe of righteousness, how can you be joyful? How can you be joyful if you don't have a right standing before God, if you're not righteous in his sight, but he sees you as a wicked sinner? How can you be joyful if you haven't been reconciled unto God? This is how you're joyful. The mind set on the Spirit is life and peace. And I will greatly rejoice in the Lord, and my soul shall be joyful in my God. For he has clothed me in the garments of salvation. He has covered me in the robe of righteousness. And this is through faith, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith in Christ Jesus, which is his commandment. This is his commandment to believe on the name of the Son of God, which is how we abide in the love of God. If you keep my commandments, you'll abide in my love. If you believe in me and what I accomplish, that I have made you holy without blemish and free from accusation, covered you with the garments of salvation and the robe of righteousness, you will have joy, you will have the peace, because you'll be abiding in him, in your mind. The mind set on the spirit is life and peace. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abides in me bears much fruit. So abiding in Christ is living by faith in the Son of God who loved us and gave himself up for us on an ongoing basis, and that is dying to the law. To be able to bear this fruit, you have to die to the law. Brothers and sisters, you have died to the law through the body of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you might be joined to another, that is, him has been raised from the dead, in order that you might bear fruit to God. So to bear fruit to God, you have to die to the law. To bear the fruit of peace and joy and the fruits of the Spirit, you have to die to that which stands against you. That whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law that the whole world would become guilty before God and every mouth would be stopped. Therefore, by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for only by the law comes the knowledge of sin. So only by the law comes the knowledge of guilt, condemnation, that you're a sinner. So you have to die to the law to take on the justified not guilty verdict and that you're a saint and so that you can bear the fruit of joy and peace. It says you have died to the law in order that you might bear fruit to God. So to bear fruit to God, you have to die to the guilty ruling that stands against us and take on what Christ has done, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. A lot of people that are fruit inspectors don't affirm that you have a justified not guilty verdict by your faith by which you have peace with God. They try to employ themselves as fruit inspectors. They self-appointed them to be fruit inspectors, but they don't understand how fruit is actually born. It's through the knowledge of Christ, his life, and his work, and mind that is set on that. A lot of fruit inspectors will not affirm that we are covered with the robe of righteousness by faith, by which we have joy, but yet they want to be these fruit inspectors. But they want to take away the very means by which fruit is born, and that is through the knowledge and the clarification of the accomplishments of Christ through the gospel and who we are on the basis of his life and his work. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he has clothed me in the garments of salvation. He has covered me with a robe of righteousness. See, he covered me with a robe of righteousness, and I could have never been righteous through the law. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness came through the law, then Christ died needlessly. So this Joy I have because I have been clothed with the robe of righteousness is not because I kept the law. 
I can't keep the law. Whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law that the whole world would become guilty before God and every mouth would be stopped. Therefore, by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. Only by the law comes the knowledge of sin. By the law comes the knowledge of sin. By Christ comes the knowledge that we're justified, that he was handed over for our sins and he was raised for our justification. And we maintain a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. That we have a justified not guilty verdict by our faith in Christ Jesus independent from law performance. So the robe of righteousness does not come to the law. I do not nullify the grace of God for if righteousness came to the law then Christ died needlessly. Righteousness does not come to the law. This is why Paul says, May I be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own which comes through the law, but that which comes through faith in Jesus Christ, even the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. So may I be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own through the law. That would reference your performance, your obedience, your behavior. It's not what you have done or what you will do. It's not of your own. It's not a righteousness of your own, which means it's God's righteousness, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith in Christ Jesus upon all and unto all who believe, and there is no difference. So the one who's believing these things, they're conceptually abiding in their mind, in Christ, his life, and his work. And that person will greatly rejoice in the Lord, and their soul shall be joyful in their God, for he has clothed them with the garments of salvation, he has covered them with the robe of righteousness. So keeping yourselves in the love of God is looking to the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's looking to what he has accomplished and what he has done. You can never fall out of the love of God only in your mind for a time when someone thinks, I don't think God loves me. I don't think he loves me as much as I thought he loved me before. That is not keeping yourself in the love of God. We're always in the love of God from God's perspective, it has to do with our perspective, a changing of mind from our perspective. But from his perspective, we're always in the love of God. We're more than conquerors to him that loved us, for I am persuaded that neither life, nor death, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So from God's perspective, we are always in the love of God. It has to do with changing our perspective so that we Keep ourselves in the love of God in our minds, knowing the truth. The truth that Christ has loved us even as he is loved by the Father. Father, I and them, you and me, that they may be perfected in unity, and that the world may know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me, that we're loved even as the Son is loved with an undying, unchanging, everlasting, unending perfect love that we can never be separated from so i'm going to wrap it up here brothers and sisters i hope your night or day is going good grace and peace be multiplied to you uh, let's see Oda, i think i'm gonna go over here get some uh some porridge with my free will I, I'm, I'm hungry so i'm gonna go over here and get something to eat here and uh see what she's got Hands, put the little porridge in the bowl. Oh boy, it's, it's, it smells. It smells not very good, but I don't really have a lot. Of, I don't have a lot of choices here. I uh, Riddick, I need to talk to you about free will. This doctrine that you've uh, been espousing. Step aside. Step aside. <clears throat> Irenic, you really need to get off your Pelagian free will high horse, my my son. And accept what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches over and over that, that God's will comes to... I, I don't want to hear it. I'm sick of hearing this. I bring up the conversation, but I'm sick of talking about it. Irenic, do not be deceived. Every perfect gift comes down from above. You don't self-righteously attain to it. It comes down from God from God in his choice and by his will that's how we are in Christ Jesus and you need to listen what yes uh, but I I'm sick of this I'm sick of true speller I'm sick of Saint Tommy I'm sick of all this grace out I know you and Peter both of you both of you need to submit to the scriptures both of you the scriptures clearly tell us that it is God's choice, not man's will. Those born not of the will of the flesh, 
nor of the will of man, nor of human decision, but they were born of God. That's how they received him. They were born of him. You need to get over it. You need to climb down off your legalist, little self-righteous, little do-gooder, I made the right choice, high horse. You're boasting. Yes, you're boasting. Boasting in choice. Not God's choice, your choice. Ah, what is it with these? Every time I plant a seed about God's grace and predestination, I got one of you Pelagians digging it up. Enough. Enough. Submit to the scriptures. Peter too. Peter doesn't get out of this. He's been ha he's been the, the flesh you've been leaning on. The scripture says not to lean on the arm of flesh, but lean on the scriptures. You're leaning on your own understanding. No, I'm not. Yes, you are. Yeah, you don't understand. Yes, I do. You're going by how you feel. By your emotions. That's how you're judging God. By your own fallen emotions. You judge 